Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, why do counselors and other similar mental health professionals try to prevent suicide? So I've heard a lot of different questions over the years about this topic. And most people, overwhelmingly, the majority of people in the mental health community want to prevent suicide. They view suicide as a negative outcome. But there are some in the general public and a few in the mental health community that kind of challenge this stance that most counselors have, this idea of preventing clients from committing suicide whenever possible. And I've heard arguments like counselors are mean when they do this, or counselors don't respect the autonomy of clients when they do this. And oftentimes it comes down to this idea I've heard also many times about this concept of rational suicide. This idea that an individual can rationally make a decision to end their own life. And a lot of times when you hear the term rational suicide, we're really talking about a completely different situation than we're talking about in mental health settings. We're talking about somebody who's terminally ill, somebody who's quite elderly and doesn't view the medical problems that they're facing as worth it, so they want to end the pain. So as you can see, it's a whole different topic. When mentioning rational suicide and comparing it to a counselor-client relationship, two issues are really being conflated here. But then I've also heard this other additional argument, and this is why set individuals with mental disorders aside? Why push them out of this whole argument about rational suicide? Because what we're really suggesting here is all people with mental disorders are irrational. That's what we're saying if we exclude them from the discussion. Now you could also say, why is somebody without a mental disorder always considered rational? Right? There's a few different ways to look at that. But I understand the point. The point here is, does having a mental disorder really tell us anything about somebody's ability to make a decision like that? And the answer here is yes, it does. It actually tells us a lot. If we look at what precipitates suicide, what facilitates suicide, we see depression, substance use, and impulsivity. These are actually massive risk factors for suicide. And they align with certain mental disorders, like major depressive disorder, substance use disorder. We see impulsivity in a number of disorders, like borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder, and we also see it in antisocial personality disorder. So there is important information when we know that somebody has certain mental disorders that does tell us something important about risk factors. Now, of course, there's always going to be an exception. A person with a mental disorder in certain situations, of course, can make rational choices, just like somebody without a mental disorder may not be able to make rational choices all the time. So again, we have to look at both sides, like I indicated before. But yes, you can always find an exception. And I'm really not talking about here the few exceptions that I've heard of, and I certainly have seen convincing arguments over a few exceptions. I'm talking about the vast majority of individuals with mental disorders and how they approach suicidal ideation, intent, and plan. So what does the evidence tell us? Right? We can get into a debate here very easily about suicide and morals and ethics and everything, but what do we know from science? Well, there are a ton of statistics about suicide, and I'm only really going to use one here to more or less demonstrate my point. The vast majority of people who attempt suicide and do not complete suicide are glad that they're alive. 90% of those who attempt suicide and don't complete don't die by suicide, even eventually, even many years down the road. They die from something else. Natural causes, a medical illness, something other than suicide. So if all those individuals had completed suicide, at least 90% would have regretted that decision. Again, just one statistic, but it's a powerful statistic. So how many rational suicides, as they're called, would really be rational? So science here, the evidence, doesn't actually support the idea that counselors should back off and just allow individuals with mental disorders to commit suicide if they want to. It supports the idea that prevention of suicide 
makes sense. It's logical. We don't have to move to any philosophical arguments or theological arguments to support this point, although there are many philosophical and theological arguments around the area of suicide as well. So with the evidence supporting the idea that suicide prevention makes sense, what about the theoretical, right? We always have this theoretical argument out there, and really it's kind of the same thing, that there must be an exception, there must be somebody who can decide rationally, and if the laws were aligned with that, they could rationally plan a suicide and complete it. And of course, the laws vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And I think this theoretical argument, this kind of ignores the aggregate, right? It ignores the large amount of data we have here. But either way, I know this argument's out there. And I think this is a very easy argument to make if you haven't worked with a large number of people who have suicidal ideation. The I don't understand someone's feelings argument really works both ways here. So if you're really focusing on the exception, if you're focusing on somebody with a mental disorder who could make a rational decision of that type, you're not focusing on all of the people who can't. I don't think there's really a way to make this exception policy work with these type of numbers. We're talking about maybe one in a thousand people, one in 10,000 people who'd be capable of this. I don't know, but it'd be a small number. I worked in an agency for a while, I supervised an agency that had a census of a thousand clients. That means that there was a thousand clients there that we were responsible for at the largest size of the agency. And in the entire period of time I was there, and with all the people I interacted with, I never saw one of these exceptions. I can't recall ever seeing one of these exceptions that's theoretical, where somebody has a mental disorder, but they can still carefully plan out a suicide. They've kind of worked it all out. They understand their values. They understand the consequences. They've thought about it for a long period of time. None of the emotions like anger or euphoria or anxiety or depression or anything like that were getting in the way. I don't recall seeing that ever, not even one time. Life is a lot messier, I think, than people imagine when they come up with these theoretical arguments. If you've worked in the field and you've worked with people every day who are suicidal, you have a different perspective about what the odds are that you're really going to see an exception. So with this theoretical argument, this is really focusing on a very small number of people. Now, that doesn't mean those people aren't important, and we do have to address this issue. This is an important issue to discuss at all different levels, but it is a small number. The larger issue would be the individuals who have a desire to commit suicide, and we have to work as a mental health counseling community to prevent that, to prevent that harm. That is the larger issue because it involves a greater number of people. It really just comes down at some point to statistics. Are we going to put our efforts toward finding these few exceptions, or are we going to put our best efforts towards suicide prevention? Now, I've also heard the argument here that we could do both. We could acknowledge that we have to prevent suicide most of the time, but still acknowledge these exceptions. And this is problematic, and I'll talk about why I think this is problematic in a few moments. But first I want to cover, from my experience, why people commit suicide. What's the real reason they commit suicide? If they're not coming in with a rational plan, with all these different theoretical arguments and philosophical arguments, and all these arguments from all these different places, what are they really thinking? Well, people in my experience, commit suicide for a few different reasons. And the main one is to escape pain. We also see that there's a feeling of hopelessness. We see that people contemplating suicide have lost their sense of purpose. They don't see any way out of their situation other than suicide. And also, and this can't be overstated, impulsivity and substances play a huge part in suicide attempts and completed suicides. There's no getting around that. These aren't, as I mentioned before, usually carefully planned. These are impulsive decisions, oftentimes made more impulsive by the disinhibiting effects of alcohol and other substances. As I mentioned before, the mental health counseling community needs to do a better job addressing the issue of suicide. There's no doubt about that. That's fairly clear. I understand that it doesn't work out perfectly for everybody who has suicidal ideation. They can go into an agency and get effective treatment immediately, and that is a problem. But have we thought ahead 
to how permitting a rational suicide, as I'm talking about it here, in the counseling settings, have we really thought about how this would turn out? There's no perfect solution on the suicide issue, but do we want mental health clinicians thinking of rational suicide first when they see a client, or second, or even ninth or tenth? Or do we want them putting their best efforts toward assessing and helping that person and preventing suicide, and then maybe way down the road, if that doesn't work out, then maybe looking at something like rational suicide? If it's made an option, it's not going to be an option that gets pushed down to the end of the list. It's simply human nature. It's another option that's available, and it's going to be an option that's probably somewhere near the top, unfortunately, for some people. I think most mental health clinicians would probably still perform their jobs in a similar manner, but there will be people that rank that rational suicide option very high, and we're really just not thinking this through, in my opinion. There are a lot of consequences to considering or permitting something like this. And before we get there at all, there's all the legal considerations, of course, that would have to be dealt with. So a very complex issue, and I don't see it really simply solved. And I think allowing or encouraging rational suicide, that's not the solution. We really need to think harder in this situation. Again, looking at the statistics, we know that if rational suicide were encouraged or permitted, a lot of people would die who truly did not want to die. They may want to die in the moment, but as a value, they don't want to die. In the long run, they want to live. One of the analogies I'd like here for understanding this concept is the weather is different than the climate. Somebody may feel suicidal right now, just like it could be raining right now, but we know it's going to be sunny again in a few days. We have to understand somebody's long-term vision, their long-term values, while appreciating their mood state in the moment or their emotional state in the moment. But those emotional states are oftentimes irrational. And a lot of times, of course, long-term planning is irrational, but I think you have a better chance when you can see a person over the course of several months in terms of thinking about something like this than you could if you just saw them for a few minutes. So again, the weather is different than the climate. So as I get ready to wrap up this video, I do want to cover this idea of rational suicide as a construct and how I really question if it exists at all. I've discussed it here hypothetically like it could exist, but it's interesting. I don't know the answer to this question, but I was really thinking about this and this term, rational suicide. It has two components. Suicide, which of course we know is possible, and rational. And I wonder if anybody can really be rational when contemplating a construct like suicide. So I wonder if there's an existential crisis here, meaning does rational suicide even exist at all? And I think that would really have to be considered before any other discussions took place. Again, I don't know the answer, but I thought this was an interesting way of looking at it. Are the components rational and suicide, are they both available? Is the component specifically rational really available? I don't know. Whenever I discuss mental health topics that are controversial, which it turns out are all mental health topics, I understand there's going to be a lot of opinions there's different thoughts on mental disorders and suicide and suicide prevention. If you have ideas about what I've talked about here in this video, please put them in the comments. I'm always interested in looking at that and seeing the diversity of opinions. As always, I hope you found this video on suicide and mental disorders to be interesting. Thanks for watching.